Welcome to this new player's guide for Rattus Lord of the Dead. We're going to be going over some of the basic tips and strategies to get you started on your quest for world domination. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. This is going to be a beginner's level guide. We're not going to be talking high level play. I'm still learning the game myself at that regard. And second, with the game being in early access and developers promising balance patches every two weeks, that what you see may not represent the current version of the game and stats, skills, or strategies may be different if you're watching this video in the future. But with that said, while Arras may look like Darkest Dungeon and definitely draws parallels to it, there is a lot more elements at play or a lot of different elements at play with the Darkest Dungeon. The big one is what your focus is going to be on in terms of long-term play. Because of the fact that you cannot retreat or go back in levels, it means that you can't rely on grinding in the same sense. And Aratus focuses a lot more on the persistent layer of what upgrades and things you have access to compared to the individual layer of your characters. But we'll talk more about characters in the next few minutes. When you start the game, you'll always be given two or more or less artifacts depending upon the difficulty. And these artifacts provide you with passive benefits, and it's important to make sure you look at what you have access to at the start. From there, the next thing are your talents. These are passive and special abilities you can activate during play, and you're going to see me kind of mouse over each one, so you can get a good glimpse at them. But, as you complete battles or complete quests, you'll gain experience for Aratus that will be applied to talent points here. The further down the tree you go, the more talent points it costs. And each one of the four trees there represents a different potential strategy. Alchemy is all about enhancing your ability to create minions as well as augment them, such as by being able to swap out parts for better ones. The magic tree is about reclaiming mana during battle or after it, as well as spells that can be used to do damage and other elements to it. And mana will restore sometimes on its own where you can find special events, and you'll also be able to craft a building in the graveyard, which you'll see next, that can also earn you some mana back. But the beauty about mana is that you can always cast a spell on every turn of your character. Now, with that said, the next tree, Ire, has to do more with the use of Wrath, which is a secondary resource that builds up during combat and is used for each character's special ability. This tree provides bonus as the character is making them more dangerous, and you can also gain passives or skills that will get further activated or proc if you have enough Wrath. There's also a building in the graveyard that you'll also see that can generate wrath at the start of combat, so you can immediately make use of special moves. But, you will need to make use of both mana and wrath if you want to have access to additional abilities and kind of gives, or kind of gives you a way of evening out the advantages the enemy has. And then finally, destruction is just about pure stress or vigor damage to enemies with the spells growing more in terms of costs, as well as being able to affect more enemies on the field with it. And so these are your ways of kind of being able to finish off an enemy or set themselves up to be finished by one of your minions. And again, between this and the magic skill, or the magic tree, you're going to have a lot of different tools you can play around with to kind of, again, even the odds when you're fighting the various enemies. In terms of building your own strategy around, there doesn't seem to be a wrong way, but several of the first tier or first tier perks seem to be very useful for everyone. Stuff that gives you a greater chance of getting body parts, being able to swap out uh, parts of characters for higher quality ones, and even just the level 1 damage and stress skills can go a long way towards helping things out while you're playing. Now, once you're done with that, the other major element of persistence, or things to keep track of during a campaign run of Aratus, is the cemetery. The cemetery itself is where you're going to gain access to a lot of buildings that provide passive benefits that activate after each battle or event on the map. 
In order to construct these buildings, you first need to sacrifice a minion of the chosen type, and then you must use your architect's souls. That's the resource in the upper right-hand corner of the screen right now. And I'm not going to... I'll let the screenshots do the talking here in terms of what each building does, but this is a very big point, and it's one, excuse me, that I think the tutorial doesn't go into enough detail about. Being able to get additional mana or wrath for each battle is a huge deal, as well as being able to leave units here and get free experience for them. But the big one, in terms of being able to prolong and keep your units alive, is the Mortuary. And I would suggest maybe sacrificing an early shade to fill up or open up two of those slots in it. Being able to guarantee that two units are going to come back to full health at the end of your next event or battle is a huge plus to cultivating units and getting them leveled up. While getting free resources like parts and items can also help you out if you get them early and you start cultivating them. Now the minions in Eraz are all built around these fixed characters as you see in the upper left hand corner of the screen, with more unlocked as you play through the game. Once they're unlocked, they remain available for all playthroughs going forward. The units themselves require parts as you see on the right, and higher quality parts can be found or crafted that will come with a random benefit. And you'll have to kind of figure out how to apply them to your various characters. Each enemy, or each one of our lovely minions here, comes with different abilities. Five normal and one ultimate. That requires the use of Wrath, as we described earlier. Now, while every character does get access to physical or uh, vigor-based damage, as well as stress-based, some are better at, at one or the other. For instance, the Wrath and Banshee are pretty good at causing stress damage while the Skeleton and Dark Knight are good at doing physical damage to some extent. Now, the twist of the game, or what you can do to further augment them, is that when a character levels up, you can apply a point to each one of their skills. And this point will provide a passive benefit, but it will also transform the skill. And this is a way of allowing you to find characters and build teams that are better together or more synergized. You could make the Dark Knight have a better chance of doing stress damage or augment his vigor damaging base skills further. It's entirely up to you based on how you want these characters to work together. And this really is the major extent of character progression with one exception. You can sometimes find artifacts that provide special benefits to your characters, a minion can only equip up to two, and once equipped they cannot be removed, but get the right artifacts onto characters that make use of it, and you can really start to fine tune these characters, and make things a little bit even more powerful in your favor. However, it's going to be completely up to RNG which ones you get access to, let alone what units you'll have at any given time. But with that said, we're going to take a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters and sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the finer points of combat next. And now a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom Patreon supporters and sponsors. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. When it comes to combat in Aratus, again, this is where you can definitely see the parallels to Darkest Dungeon. You have your party on the left, the enemies on the right. Order of action is based on the character's speed, and normally the enemies will usually get first strike against you. When it comes to combat, every character has skills that can be used in different positions and will affect different areas on the enemy's side. Now, everybody can get access to things called stances. This provides them with a special benefit until the stance runs out, or can be used to activate and do a bonus attack if the right conditions are met. Now, as you look along the bottom of the screen, you can see the skills on the left, your access to spells on the right, and your current supply of mana and wrath in the middle. 
Now, characters have a variety of stats in the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the enemies, bottom left for your guys. Big ones to keep in mind are armor. That is the one that's to the right of the sword. This is the one that determines how much physical damage is negated based on that supply. If the armor is too high up, your characters may not be able to do damage to the enemy or vice versa. Now with that said though, you've probably also noticed that the enemies have an additional bar on the under their vigor on the right. That is their stress level. Stress, as in with the Darkest Dungeon, will build up based on specific attacks or if your party met, gets crit damage on them. And it does affect things. And we'll show off a battle with that in the next, I would say next 20 seconds. But when you're fighting most enemies, the vigor damage or direct damage is usually the safest bet as unless there are specific healers in the game, which I haven't seen yet, which I sh I'm assuming there are, they will not be able to recover health. Likewise, your characters also have trouble recovering health until you get some better minions or spells on the field. Now, once enemy runs out of health, well, you know, they're dead. And while that certainly works for most encounters, once you start running to enemies with high enough armor, you are going to have to make use of stress attacks. Stress attacks will only do damage to an opponent's stress bar, and cannot be blocked by armor. If you look on these enemies on the screen there, the shields underneath their health means that they will essentially negate the next vigor base attack. There's also the ward that you can see on my shade on the left there, that's kind of like the purple shield, which negates magic or stress based damage. But you'll find as you get further into the game that enemies will have different pools of vigor or stress. Some enemies will outright be immune to one of those kinds of damage. The rock golems that can show up sometimes in elite fights completely negate stress because, well, they're not alive to do anything. But most humanoid based enemies can be stressed down. As you do stress damage to an enemy, there's a chance of them going insane. And this is like uh, suffering a negative quirk in the darkest dungeon. When a character breaks like that, the insanity effect is randomly chosen. Some may give the enemy increased accuracy, but they may do far less damage. Other ones may inc improve their chance to dodge, but makes them more likely to run away. And you can even get some really fun ones, such as one that gives them a chance of attacking their own friends by betraying them. Now, as you keep doing stress damage to an enemy there, once it hits zero, they are in hard attack range. What happens is, once an enemy has zero stress, any further stress damage on them has a percentage chance of causing a heart attack. It doesn't matter if you do one point of stress or 50 points of stress. It's still up to RNG. Now, when, you, when they die from a heart attack, it doesn't matter what their health is, similar to the Darkest Dungeon. And this is an effective way of fighting enemies with high armor. The downside though is that once enemy is down to zero, you're basically up to the whims of the RNG gods as to whether or not you can kill that enemy. And if an enemy recovers their stress, either via skill or getting a crit, then you have, you have to once again get them back down to zero again in order to further get that chance. And one last thing to keep in mind about insanity is that when a character goes insane, instead of breaking, they may rise to the occasion like in the Darkest Dungeon and become emboldened. When that occurs, they'll recover full stress bar and gain a very nasty positive buff that will last until the end of combat. Now, from what I've seen, if an enemy runs away, it still counts as a victory towards you. I don't know at the moment if you still get parts or resources for it. But once an enemy has been triggered to run, you can pretty much leave them alone. They're going to leave the battle no matter what. And when it comes to playing Erratus, a major part of the game is understanding what enemies are susceptible to which kind of damage and building your teams around it. If you take an all stress-based team in and there is a golem, 
chances are you're going to lose that fight. Likewise, a whole vigor based team is going to have a hard time if you're up against armored knights and characters that have multiple wards on them. And this is just going to have to come with practice and maybe the game reveals to you what enemies you're fighting. But, as you were talking about in the last part, being able to build your characters around different strategies as well as augment their skills is a major part of the high level play of the game. And how you do this is going to be entirely up to you. And it's a very clever part, but other than that, outside of just showing more footage of these characters dying, there's not much else we're going to be able to go into for this beginner's guide. So to start to wrap things up, I'm just going to let the footage play out while we're doing this. When it comes to Aratus, your major strategy is going to be built around unlocking new options and cultivating your cemetery in terms of structures and having minions working for you. Many characters as you can leveled up and powered up so you have a greater pool to choose from. Because unlike the darkest dungeon here, due to how both stress and vigor damage has to be kept accounted for, you're going to need a larger pool of characters to swap in and out. This is especially true when you come to boss fights, who at this moment will immediately repair up to 100% if you lose the battle, so you must have a team ready and raring to go. Also, losing minions isn't that big of a deal starting out, but if you start cultivating them with higher quality parts and artifacts attached to them, losing them is going to be a very big deal because you're losing those parts and additional options. So again, do whatever you can to keep your units alive, and that's why I suggested at the start to upgrade the healing building to accommodate for two. Now another thing you should keep in mind that we can't talk about here are the additional unit unlocks that come with playing the game. These units are going to add more strategies to your field as well as give you new team dynamics, but at the moment I don't have any unlocked and I can't tell you who's good or bad and which one to focus on. But there's still plenty of months of early access to keep looking at Varanus. We'll be trying to take cracks at it on stream. And when the game hits 1.0, I'm sure we'll do a Let's Play run of it on the channel. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions for me, be sure to leave them down below. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we some of the art and science of games. Until our next video, have a great night. If you're looking for a book on design, my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, is out now. It is available where most books are sold, and it comes in paper, hardcover, or digital copies. This is the perfect book for anyone interested in learning about game design, whether you are a student, enthusiast, or just a fan. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom where we examine the art and science of games.